for two of our training sessions. Uh, we're going to start with more discussion from Pedro about what you can do with neutral atoms, and we'll finish with some question and answers. And just a reminder, if you want to write your questions in the, the Google Doc, you can access it here. Let me make sure that I open the Google Docs as well in case I want to take a look at some of these questions later. And um, uh, maybe I should start with asking if there is any question left from yesterday that I could address. Hi, Yanni. Hi. <laughs> Uh, can we ask open questions? Or? As well, just as well, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I missed uh, the talk yesterday, but uh, so I'm a Quera user uh, through AWS. And so I was wondering uh, what kind of interface Nurse was thinking. Uh, or it, is it? We, uh, <laughs> yeah, we don't, we don't quite know yet. So we have this two year. Um... Uh, partnership with Quera, where we're getting to know their uh, technology, we're using their hardware, we're actually using it through AWS right now. Uh, and longer term, yeah, we're, we're evaluating it as a platform for our users. Um, and I think we, we would have to work out exactly what type of interface we would want to use. So that's a question in progress. Uh -huh. So uh, from uh, as a AWS user, so I use uh, IonQ and okay. uh, and uh, so the handling of the task on the Quera for people who don't have sophistication in uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, writing script for this is a little complicated. So uh, I was wondering if Nurse was thinking to have a way to handle multiple tasks. And so that's an aspect that would be very important for me, but that's... Uh, yeah, one of um, our researchers, Jan, who gave a talk yesterday, he's been digging into this quite a bit and is, has his own pipeline set up that might become a more standard pipeline in the future. Uh -huh. Maybe we can put uh, Yannick in contact with uh, with Jan yeah. Uh, because okay. yeah, and and you see, Katie, Katie, the people, the people are calling for it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we, we Yannick and I did not plan on this. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <sorry. laughs> That's great. <laughs> All right. So maybe we can uh, we can get to business a little bit and uh, and uh, so today we actually have a little more time and a single topic. So this is going to be a little more aligned with uh, how this uh, the sessions uh, are usually played. So uh, maybe a quick question for everyone: Who has blockading installed right now? Who, or who succeeded at doing that or has it available for you right now so that we I can see if we you can just put a thumbs up if you yeah okay 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 three four five six oh my god it's multiplying seven okay not too bad not too bad <laughs> okay so um I will well I emphasize that it will be interesting if you can get a blockade working so that we can work on some activities together. But I believe that uh, in any case, I think that we can uh, look, you know, really, really together on, on how we are doing this and uh, work from my own screen and and, uh, and see how these things play out. Uh, so I will pick up uh, my slides and my notebook. And we are going to do this. So yesterday, we were looking at the very basics and uh, really just, uh, you know, how to generate, to create a register, how to create uh, waveforms. And uh, the goal today is to bring that to the next level, right? So meaning, how do we look at the physics of this? How do we understand the physics of this? Um, this I mean, this type of technology. And how do we close that pipeline of starting with creating a register, defining waveforms, and turn that into a full kind of application solution of a specific problem? And uh, we will focus mostly on physics-related questions. 
and uh, we will use uh, uh, some RABI oscillations as a, a kind of a, 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 a test base to, to learn a few of the concepts and then go for phase transitions a little bit. And we will be talking about the concepts together with blockade will be you know alternating between the two of them uh, so that we know how to convert one into the other. So that's the goal today to be able to to wrap up, right? So you learn how to start a program or to the, the basic functionalities that allow you to define a program. Today we will look at specific applications and how you finish wrapping up, go to simulations and uh, and that's gonna be it. So uh, the story so far, as I mentioned, consider the architecture, analog versus gate-based operations, hardware constraints, it's very important in this paradigm, paradigm of FPQAs. And uh, the motivation now is that there's been a lot of uh, interesting simulations and, and applications in physics that have happened. So these are just four of them. So phase transitions and criticality, that's going to be our focus but also some dynamics, so many body scars, spin liquids, and optimization. I guess I, I discussed a little bit about optimization yesterday. So uh, the, the goal then of today is to be able to reach the point where we can kind of address some of these uh, the simulations that have been done and use that as a motivation for your own future experiments. I like learning objectives. So these are my learning objectives for today, or these are our learning objectives for today. So I think that this always help us um, kind of uh, set the expectations right, right? So for what uh, you, you think you see, what to, I expect you to pay attention to. So three topics. We will learn how to describe the, the Rydberg blockade phenomenon. We'll be able to compute the dynamics of some multi-qubit Rydberg systems, describing the effects of uh, this blockade that I just mentioned, and uh, uh, of the blockade on Rabi oscillations. And we'll be uh, able to analyze the phases of uh, Rydberg systems on square lattice. So it's very kind of uh, uh, modest, but uh, these uh, are very important concepts that will set the stage for any other future application that you will want to do. So picking up from yesterday, there were three terms in the Hamiltonian. Two of them were diagonal. One of them was off-diagonal. So the off-diagonal is what you're seeing here. If you remember the nomenclature, omega was the Rabi term, phi is the phase. These guys are responsible for jumping from ground to Rydberg and Rydberg to ground. And uh, there was then the diagonal pieces, so the detuning and the interaction term. So detuning, phase, and Rabi are controlled in a time-dependent fashion by the user. The interaction is also controlled by the user, but only geometrically. Only geometrically. So let's try to take this and start to study some, some problems uh, uh, of dynamics then so rabi oscillations so i expect that most of the audience has already looked at rabi oscillations one time or another in life but if you haven't this is what this topic is all about so you take one qubit so a two-level system you put it into one of your computational bases here is going to be the ground state in an initial time and then you apply a a field to it so a hamiltonian which uh, is off diagonal in this case is going to look like a sigma x and when you solve the time evolution of this qubit so you're going to get uh, a state that looks like this one that you're seeing down there so it has some oscillatory terms between the ground and the Rydberg and in particular if uh, you measure the number operator if you remember number is zero in the ground state and one in the Rydberg state all that you're going to get is just this cosine squared uh, which is, means that you're going to see some oscillation. Remember that cosine square, it's going to oscillate with a frequency that is twice uh, what you see in the argument. So well, that's what you're seeing here, right? So this uh, uh, Rabi oscillation term. So that's what we call the Rabi oscillation, right? So this, this, this oscillation of a qubit that's prepared in a in a computational in a you know in a, in a given axis, in a state of a, a given axis, and is uh, perturbed by a constant. Uh, 
field in a perpendicular axis. And the, uh, we will use this as a, uh, oh, R and D, R and G are interchanged. Uh, it, they might be, I will have to double check my, my calculation. I thought that I did this uh, correctly, but uh, it might, this uh, is really a phase that will pick up uh, depending on the initial conditions that you choose. So uh, um, I guess just by looking at T equals zero shows that they must be interchanged, right? So yep. that's what you're saying. Yep. Yeah, I'll, I'll double check. Thanks for noticing. I'll, I'll take a note of, of this. Um, uh, thank you, Yannick. So what we'll do is to try to put this on blockade to see how the pipeline of doing a simulation looks like. So the way it's going to go, I'm, I'm just going to import a few, a few packages that are important. We're going to have one atom. So this is highly <laughs> unexciting. Right? So it's going to be an atom list with one qubit, one atom position at 0, 0. So that's what uh, we have here. And we are going to create a Hamiltonian that is going to contain the waveforms. I, I am going to kind of, instead of creating the waveforms in separate, I'm Creating, putting the waveforms directly in the in the Hamiltonian function. So this is something that we had not seen yesterday. Uh, if you want to create that Hamiltonian, something that is analog to to this object here, or technically this one, what you do is you call the object called Rydberg underscore h, Rydberg h. You feed it the register in this case atom one for our single atom. So this has to come in the shape of an atom list in on blockade and then you will feed it uh, with uh, the waveforms that we are defining so in this case we are taking a detuning delta equals zero and uh, uh rabi frequency that is two pi times two uh, uh megahertz so you see that when you run this guy it uh plots a cute, uh, a cute uh, you know uh, uh, algebraic equation for you so that you can double check if you got everything all right and then we are going to run this uh, this job. So we're going to initialize a state. You're going to take a, a register. We're going to create that register. It's going to contain a one qubit. And we're going to define it in the zero state. So here we go. Very fast. And now we're going to do the evolution. So the, the evolution here is uh, a little bit uh, uh, more complicated than, than usual, just because we have to kind of, we want to study a time dependent phenomenon. So we have to allow a blockade here to to create time slices uh, so that we can measure at each of those times. So that's what we are doing. We're going to evolve the system for 1.5 microseconds, remembering that the time unit on blockade is microseconds. We're going to have clocks at every you know 10 to the minus two second, and we are going to choose a solver for the differential equation for Schrödinger equation. So the solver that we're going to pick is called Krylov, Krylov evolution. This is part of the, the Julia packages that uh, blockade is part of. We're going to feed it to the register. That is this one. We're going to feed the clocks at which we are measuring. And of course, we have to feed it to the Hamiltonian. And now we're going to... So, so this, this is really the, the... Up to here is the solution part, is the simulation. Everything below is just uh, preparing grounds for for measuring and for looking at uh, at the data so what this is doing is to creating a vector here of uh, zeros uh, of length uh, one for each step on the clocks and then we are just saving inside this density the outcomes of prob one which is the time evolution uh, taken for uh, the each step so we, again, we are measuring the clocks, right? So we are looking at uh, extracting from this time evolution uh, the different values of the the, the density, read work density, uh, at each time step. So that's what this little piece of code is doing. And if I run it, it's going to be very fast. Remember that, Julia, the first time you run something is slow. The second time is very fast, right? And the second time and not the others. And then we can plot and see exactly the figure that we were looking at. So the pipeline, right? That's what matters for you. The pipeline is defining the atom positions, 
define the waveforms, feed both of them into a Hamiltonian. Then you have to start your system. So here we are starting in the zero state. And then you do the evolution, which is this part here. So this is the, the simulation part. Okay, so you, there's different solvers that blockade has. There's Schrodinger problem that we're going to use later. This is what's just a cryo of evolution. It's very simple. And uh, everything else is just a data analysis. Okay, so uh, this is all to convince you that it took us one, two, three, four commands to actually do a quantum simulation on blockade. And it really doesn't require uh, deep Julia expertise. Now, to keep going on um, on our concepts, I'm going to motivate the further the future discussion with uh, the following the following exercise. Right, uh, we're going to look at what happens with two atoms now. So I'm doing something that's a little bit of an overkill. We are using generate sites just to show you how to use it, uh, and it's going to create a, a chain lattice. I'm just putting two atoms side by side with a scale that here is uh, 16 micrometers. So it's pretty distant. And I'm going to evolve these two qubits exactly with the same with the same uh, uh, um, profile as before. And I will measure the total Rydberg density. OK, so we are talking about this variable n that was just a sort of uh, measuring the density of, of qubit 1. Now we are going to be measuring n1 plus n2. Okay, so it's going to be the density of qubit 1 plus the density of qubit 2. And uh, we'll see what's going to happen. So let me see. Actually, this is not what I expected to happen. I'm surprised. Ah, okay, this is what I'm expecting to happen. Okay, I just didn't run, had forgot to run this piece. So this is an exercise for you. I want to give you 30 seconds there to just give a little bit of a thought uh, at what you're seeing. And uh, I would like you to, to paste, uh, to type in the chat uh, if you understand what's happening, right? So, so describe what you're seeing, right? So we are seeing uh, oscillation. This is the oscillation of the previous uh, code for a single atom. And now in orange, you're seeing what's happening for two atoms. And uh, how do you understand this? What, how do you describe this? And this is a question for, for the audience. So please, uh, please write up. We see things coming up. In the orange case, we can have up to two atoms in the excited state. So Rydberg number oscillates between zero and two. Right, right. So we simply have two atoms that are isolated from each other. And uh, if I saw uh, the oscillation of one being going from zero to one, what I expect for two is just twice that, right? And I guess, uh, is anybody surprised by the fact that the frequency is the same? Hopefully, no one is surprised by that because, again, these are just two individual <laughs> individual atoms. <laughs> Thanks, Yannick. Yeah, I, I guess it's not surprising. Now, what's going to happen when we take these qubits and we push them farther, closer together? Right? So now we're doing the same evolution, but now the qubits are, instead of 16 microns, they're just six microns apart. And this is what we are seeing. So can we have some descriptions of uh, what you're seeing and maybe why? There are things to comment both for the y-axis and the x-axis.
So I'm again giving you some time to think and, uh, and to type in the chat. The blockade works. So we see some, uh, some, some expert opinion here. Uh, so there is some, some topic, some concept of a blockade going on here. So, so what, what is actually happening, right? So we have two atoms and they're side by side and they're much closer than they were before. Before we were seeing that uh, we could excite both atoms and the Rydberg density would go from zero to two because each of them right, would go from zero to, to one. So they just add up. And uh, they would do that coherently, right? So both of them would uh, would increase exactly exactly at the same uh, in the same uh, moments in time. Now there's something funny going on, right? So the orange curve now is just as high as the blue one. So this means that we are instead of seeing two or two atoms being excited, we are seeing only one atom being excited in a given time, right? So somehow these two atoms are being put side by side and uh, uh, instead of having two possible excitations we only get one do we remember that there was something that we talked about yesterday that uh, could cause this like there was a term in the hamiltonian that might uh, be the origin of this can anybody point it out so maybe i can look at the hamiltonian Again, just so that you can give me your feeling. So there's term omega, there's term delta, there's term V. Is somebody here specifically responsible for, for that uh, phenomenon that we don't see both atoms exciting together? Okay, I got uh, some messages here. Third term, the term in V, the VIJ term makes this unfavorable. Yes, right? So V, whenever we had just one atom excited, costs zero. If I have zero atoms excited, it costs zero. But whenever I have two atoms excited at the same time, V is costing us energy. And we are seeing that this energy depends on how far apart and how close the atoms are, right? So. This is what uh, uh, the phenomenon that uh, Yannick was alluding to. That's called a blockade, the Rydberg blockade. It is a Rydberg blockade because when atoms are in the Rydberg state, they blockade each other from being excited at the same time. Only, you know, you can have both of them there, only one of the two. There's something also interesting that is happening in the frequency. You're seeing that the frequency has changed, right? And uh, it's not perhaps too obvious to see, but can anybody guess by how much this frequency has changed? Any guesses? Feel free to guess. 16 over 6. 16 over 6, famous, famous 3, right? Famous 3, a little under 3, right? So this is actually a square root of 2. Okay, you can see that, uh, um, I guess I like to, to just count here, right? So you have one oscillation, two oscillation, and then uh, 3 a little bit over, right? So this is exactly uh, a square square root of two whenever one guy oscillated twice this oscillates a, a little over three times uh, this is a square root of two and if you put three atoms going to be a square root of three if you put four atoms going to be a square root of four and this is kind of a cute phenomenon that uh, you can you can demonstrate uh, even analytically that happens okay so that you you have an enhancement of the frequency of oscillation that is a square root of the frequency of the atoms uh, of the of the Rabi frequency that you that you put, so that's cool. I think that this is our first uh, first end to end uh, um, simulation on blockade, and it's teaching us a little concept that is this Rydberg blockade. So 
this is what we are going to discuss right now. What happens when many qubits come together? We just thought what happens with two qubits, but what if we put more qubits? So what you have been seeing is this, right? So I have two atoms. We have a, a, a Hilbert space that is four dimensional, right? So it's two times two. Uh, I'm putting a little delta detuning here just to, to lift the degeneracy. And uh, we have this four states, right? So everybody's in the ground, the ground, Rydberg, Rydberg, ground are degenerate. And then you have this Rydberg, Rydberg, right? So every time I have a Rydberg excitation, I pay delta. So let's look at that again. Whenever I have this equals to one, I pay one delta. When I have both, both equals to one, I pay one V. So I pay one delta for these guys. I pay two delta for this one above. And also I pay a V for the one above. So what's happening now is simply that when you put these atoms together, we are woo, we're right, we are expelling one of the states of the Hilbert space. So this is very, very uh, uh, similar to to this uh, kind of compactification things that sometimes you you see when you put a, a qubits or, or or atoms in a circle and you reduce the 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 radius, right? And then you 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 expel you you open the the distance between the states. So in this case, we are really pushing one of the the states, in particular, this R, R state away. So if the this energy scale right is so large that uh, it's it overcomes the energy that I pay for bit flipping with omega, then uh, effectively this state is not part of our Hilbert space anymore, and that's the Rydberg blockade phenomenon. Again, this is just a review of what we we discussed. Uh, the question that uh, is left now is how close is too close for the atoms to have gone for you know for for this uh, Rydberg Rydberg states to be uh, expelled from your Rydberg from your Hilbert space right so uh, when can I access it and when I cannot is there a scale associated with it so this Rydberg blockade paradigm does have an energy scale associated with it and that's what I we are gonna uh, look at right now so. If we have this problem with two qubits, the Hamilton is actually quite simple to write down. It looks like this. Uh, as you see, there is just uh, uh, omegas over two all the, you know, in the edges of the matrix and a V12 down there in the diagonal in the bottom, right? So I hope that uh, you can see these guys, they are just a tensor product of two sigma axes, okay? It's not, uh, so it's G1, it's like identity for G2, for atom two and then identity for atom one, and then sigma x for, for atom two. So that's how you, you build this. And I'm leaving v12 here on the corner. So as, as we mentioned before, it's proportional to the distance between the qubits to power six, uh, to power well, one over that to power six. Uh, the constant we are gonna call c6 here, it's just a name. So what does the spectrum look like? It's a little hard to, to dialyze this uh, exactly. I like to, to play a little trick. So first I kill V12. And what you see is that uh, this is just, again, it's like a sigma X plus, you know, tensor identity plus identity tensor sigma X. So the eigenvalues are plus minus omega over two, plus minus omega over two. So there's four states. Two of them have energy omega. No, one of them has energy omega. Two of them have energy zero. And one has energy minus omega. So if I reverse the problem and I kill the omegas, but I leave the V12, now this is diagonal, it's very easy. So I clearly have three states of energy zero and one state with energy V12, right? That is gonna be depending on the distance between the two qubits. So when I look at this, what I notice is that there is a kind of a, a, a characteristic energy scale here where the this state where the two atoms are excited, it crosses this state that I can reach uh, using my omega to 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 do the bit flips. And uh, when I match this, so I just say v one two equals omega, right? And then I solve for d. I am determining what's uh, the scale of this blockade uh, paradigm. So so. The, the way I like to see at this interaction V12 here is 
is like a little machine that converts energy scale into distance scale. So if omega is the energy scale that sets sets my capacity to excite states, in particular to this Rydberg Rydberg excited excitation, uh, I can just plug that omega here and figure a, a corresponding characteristic distance uh, inside which two atoms are going to uh, be blockading each other, right? So if the distance is smaller than that, the energy of this state is so high that I cannot reach it with my Rabi, uh, um, Rabi frequency. So this is cool. This sets up what happens when I have two qubits together. We end up in this situation where the, many, the effective manifold only contains ground, ground, Rydberg, ground, and ground, Rydberg. And uh, the question now is what happens when we have a lot of atoms, right? So we're going to put many of these together. And uh, I have this activity for you. And uh, what I propose is the following, right? So let's imagine I have these nine atoms. They're positioned in this square type of uh, uh, geometry. The atoms are not going to be, if, you know, point particles for, for this case, just so that it keeps simple. Uh, I'm going to define a blockade radius. So I'm going to say that I'm uh, applying a, a omega in this system that defines an omega, uh, a blockade radius that is like the red one. So atoms are seeing each other in the first neighbors, but they don't see each other in the, uh, uh, in the diagonal here, the second neighbors. And the question for you is, if I try to excite this system with as many excitations as possible, what is the pattern that is going to arise? Right. So uh, which atoms are going to be excited and which atoms cannot be excited if I try to excite as many as possible? And I'm going to invite you to click the annotate tool. Some brave soul will click the annotate tool here and it's going to kind of paint, kind of paint one of these, uh, one of these, uh, uh, atom. So let's say, for example, I'm going to excite atom number three, right? So if I excite atom number three, which other ex atoms can be excited given a blockade radius RBA? And, and uh, I'll give you time to, to think about it and, uh, and maybe paint. Or if you don't want to paint, you can always uh, just type in the chat uh, the number of the atoms that will be excited together with atom three. It's for you. So five, including the one that is already excited. Is that the only one? So we, I, we were talking about exciting as many as possible. Right, so we're talking about exciting as many as possible. So we're saying that five could be excited. Is there any other that can be excited? I'll paint five here for the team, given that five was called. One, three, five, seven, nine. One, three, five, seven, nine. So let's let's color that. One, three, five, seven, and nine. So this is what our friend is uh, suggesting. And uh, indeed, when we look at the blockade radius, right? So we were saying that uh, atoms only the first neighbor are blockading each other. So clearly, if one is excited, two and four cannot be five blocks, four, two, six, and eight. And similarly, seven blocks, four, and eight, nine blocks, six, and eight. And we are game, right? This looks like a, a, a good, uh, a good uh, uh, set of atoms to, to excite. Uh, a question for you, uh, what if I wanted to excite two, four, six, eight instead of one, three, five, seven, nine? Like why, why would that not be the most favorable situation? In other words, is this state with one, three, five, seven, 
seven nine uh, energetically degenerate with two four six eight. Do you get what I'm saying? I'm gonna I'm gonna paint the other state. So the other state is this one. Two, four, six, and eight. And the question is, are those two states degenerate or not? Depends on the sign of delta. Depends on the sign of delta. That is very correct. That is very correct. So let's say that a delta is going to be uh, positive. Yes, positive and large. Actually, to be honest, I, I would claim that uh, even even independent of delta, I would expect this uh, to be to for there to be a difference, right? Because uh, no, you're correct. Never mind. Never mind. So if delta is positive, do we have a, a difference in energy between these two states? Yes. Yes, because uh, simply this is going to count to one delta, two delta, three delta, four delta, and the other is going to count five deltas, right? So one counts four, the other counts five, which means that if I had uh, like 500 atoms in each direction, uh, the, there would be two, um, two states again. And uh, well, that's, that's an even number. If I had 501 atoms in each direction, I would have two states. They would be not degenerate, but they would be mostly, almost, almost degenerate, right? So the the difference in energy would be very, very small, because simply it's a matter of uh, 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 of uh, uh, the thermodynamic limit. So the lesson here is that uh, whenever I have the blockade mechanism. I can use it to sort of infer what's going to happen at a larger scale. You can play later with the, the case of RBB. But the point is that we can create order phases, right? So if I have a lattice of uh, atoms like this one that you're seeing, we can actually create a phase diagram of what do we expect to see depending on what is the blockade radius. And this is as function of delta so let's look at this right so as yannick was suggesting when delta equals zero pretty much we see everything is uniform right there's nothing happening here but for a given independently of uh, of the the blockade radius but if i start to increase delta what i start to see is these lobes right these lobes of different phases and uh, it's quite cute Right. So, so if the blockade radius divided by the lattice constant is of order 1, 1 1.2, 1.3, what we see is that uh, this is exactly the condition for the blockade radius to be touching the first neighbor, right? So one would be RB, the blockade radius is exactly equal to the first neighbor distance. Why 1.4 is like a square root of two, right? So that's when it starts to see the, the, the off diagonal one. So whenever RB is within this distance, one to 1.2, 1.3, atoms will be blocking each other just in the first neighbor. And if you try to excite all of them, like a large scale, many of them, you find this, what we call a checkerboard pattern. This checkerboard pattern is also known as like just a Z2 pattern or an AL phase if you're looking at uh, magnetism. Now, if you keep increasing RB, you start to see some other, other structures, right? Like the, the star phase where uh, an atom is not only blockading the 
direct first neighbors, but it's also blockading its second neighbors. And quite interestingly, you get phases in the middle of the way where you find some sort of superposition or some overlap chance of atoms being uh, between the ground and the Rydberg state. So while all these states, uh, the checkerboard and star, are just product states of zeros and ones, so they're kind of like classical phases, this phase that is called the striated phase is not classical at all because you start to see atoms here that are neither in the ground nor in the Rydberg, but rather they are in a sort of a superposition. They are slightly rotated between ground and Rydberg. And uh, this phase diagram has been characterized. It's uh, quite amusing. And uh, I want to uh, look at it on blockade with you. And we will practice uh, both creating this uh, phase diagram and uh, doing some more complicated simulation on blockade. So here we go. Uh, let me take a moment. I think that I've been going, going pretty fast. Do we have questions in any of these concepts? Please ask questions. And I don't know, Katie and Dan, if there is any anything popping up in the... Uh... You yeah. have something in the chat? Do you see oh, the chat? Something just, uh, what does S represent? Uh... Oh, S, I think that this is being characterized via uh, entropy, entanglement entropy. That's why uh, it's called S. Yeah. So this is like a probably a DMRG type of simulation. Anything about the blockade that does not make sense, that how we define the blockade radius. If there are no questions, we will move on. But uh, I will ask you to interrupt me as much as you can. So, so let's see what's going on here. Uh, we are going to create a lattice. Now it's going to be a four by four lattice. And uh, we're going to set up a distance between the atoms of 7.1 microns. That's just for sport. Then we're going to set up the blockade radius that we want. So setting up a blockade radius is actually a quite, uh, um, how do I call this? It's, uh, um, it's quite arbitrary in the sense that uh, if I put a, a blockade radius that is exact, well, I guess I guess that uh, what I'm trying to say is exactly this, this figure here, right? So uh, any blockade radius between 1 and 1.3-ish is going to allow us to be inside this checkerboard phase. So we have to pick one value. We have to pick one value. One, val one way of picking this uh, blockade radius that we like uh, here at Quera is to do a geometric average between the minimal distance that you want to block and the uh, maximal distance after which you don't want to block, right? So this means what? This means that uh, uh, the minimal distance that I, I want to block, I want atoms to see each other, is one lattice constant, A. And between the diagonal and so on and forwards, right? So like 13 to 10, 13 to 15, et cetera, we don't, we, we don't care anymore. So uh, the maximum distance before I start blockading things that uh, I don't want to blockade is going to be square root of two here. So I do a square root of two times A, right? The lattice constant. So uh, I do a geometric average and that's going to be the square root of square root of two. And this is just... Just a kind of a convenient way of setting up a blockade radius. So if I take this uh, RB over A, I am exactly at 1.19, which, if you remember from here, is roughly like uh, on top of this dashed line that you're seeing. So that's uh, quite a convenient place to be. Uh, 
then what do I do? I'm going to use an interesting function here on blockade, which is uh, the plot function of blockade. So I just call blockade.plot and I feed it atoms and I feed it something here. I feed the blockade radius. I define the blockade radius above and I let it plot for me. And it's quite interesting that a blockade is capable of uh, drawing for you the connections that this given choice of blockade radius is creating. So that uh, if uh, you screw up by any reason and uh, you make blockade, the blockade radius too large, right? Let's say plus 10. Oh my God, we are clearly, clearly seeing too many people. We don't want to get to go that far. This is also too many people, but uh, this blockade radius here is just right, right? It's, it's gonna block uh, exactly the first neighbors. Then I have to fix my schedule for preparing this quantum state. And the way I'm going to do this is exactly inspired by this, uh, by this figure, right? So this figure tells me that if I keep an omega that generates a blockade radius of 1.2, and I start with my qubits in the ground state, everybody in the zero state, and I start ramping, 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 ramping my delta. This, by the way, this small delta is already big delta, okay? Um, if I stop with my delta at some point like this, like the delta over omega equals to 2.6-ish, uh, I will be able to create the a state that looks like the checkerboard phase. Right? So I, all I have to do is to, again, take my delta, start with it, it's very negative. So all my states are, my atoms are in the ground state. And then I ramp, 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 ramp in the presence of an omega that generates this RB um, equals to 1.2. So that's what we're going to do. I'm going to start by just defining my omega max that I'm going to extract from this formula here, down here, the purple one. So I just uh, invert this, right? So given RB, I can find what's the maximum value of omega. And then I'm gonna pull the piecewise linear and piecewise constant uh, functions that we learned yesterday, right? So uh, I'm gonna to create, I'm going to create this system that ramps from negative delta to a positive delta. Uh, here, the delta, the final delta that I'm picking is simply fixed by uh, uh, by uh, 2.5 times omega max that I'm extracting from this figure, right? So about 2.5 omega max, I'm gonna be here. Boom. And uh, then we do the, the omega. So omega is gonna just uh, ramp up and it's gonna stop exactly at a value, maximum value that is fixed by the blockade radius. So we do it. And uh, we're going to, now that we have the atoms and the waveforms, just like we learned in the Arabi oscillation, we take the function Rydberg H, we feed it the atoms, we feed it the waveforms, and we get our Hamiltonian. That I'm calling Hamiltonian H kings because I forgot to, to change the nomenclature. <laughs> there you go. So... Besides generating the Hamiltonian, I am already doing the solution, the actual solution for the problem. So you see that uh, instead of using the Krylov solver, I'm using this other solver that's called Schrodinger problem. Uh, we feed it the register, the initial register, so the initial condition, zero states for all the qubits inside of the Hamiltonian H. That's here. It's going to evolve for a total time of T max. And I'm going to feed it the Hamiltonian H. Let me do this again just to make sure. And done. So I think that I like to appreciate that we have just done a quantum dynamics problem for a 16 by 6, you know, a 16 qubit problem, 2 to the 16, quantum dynamics for about 0.6 microseconds. And that took us eight seconds on blockade. Okay, so what's this quantum dynamics doing? It's preparing a state that starts in the ground state and evolves, 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 evolves in the under the effect of the Rydberg Hamiltonian and stops when delta is equal to 2.5 uh, 
times omega uh, right over here. And the state that was the ground state should become then uh, the checkerboard state. We can check if that's the case. I can extract from the, prob the problem. I can extract the register and plot a histogram. And what we see is something that is quite cute, that there is some uh, degeneracy structure here, which is not surprising because of uh, uh, the, the parity of the lattice. I'm picking only the 10 largest probabilities. And this is a little hard to read, but it's very easy to plot. And if you plot, what you see is exactly a state that is a checkerboard, right? So you see 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if you look at the second state, uh, uh, they are exactly the two reversed ones. So right, uh, like red, white, red, white, white, red, white, red, right? And then you continue. Uh, but you can also pick up the plot, the third largest probability. And what you see is that this is not a checkerboard state. So if this is a histogram of the probability of each of the states that compose the, the, the superposition of the final state of the system after our uh, uh, algorithm, we see that the two highest probability ones are the checkerboard states, but there are others that uh, are not the checkerboard state and, and they should not, right? Because uh, what happens is that uh, as we go through this phase transition, the gap gets smaller, smaller, and smaller. And we are not going to go from ground state to ground state perfectly, but rather it's going to go from ground state to a little bit of another mixture. Uh, and the slower we can go, the higher the chance of seeing the ground state, but there will always be a small admixture of other, uh, of other states here. Are we following this? Do we have questions? I will leave this figure here. That's cute. Why do you think? Can you flash the Hamiltonian? Yes, we will. I will flash the Hamiltonian. We just finished drinking some water. So let's look at the Hamiltonian. Uh, better to look at the, the full one. Here we go. Right, so what was happening here, we took the phi equals zero. We took this omega to have this trapezoid, uh, uh, or trapeze really, uh, uh, protocol. We took this delta to go from negative values to positive values. And this VIJ is corresponding to, to just the distance for this, uh, uh, for this square lattice, right? This delta in the beginning was very negative. Therefore, all the ends wanted to be zero. But in the end, delta was positive. And because of this minus sign, I wanted to have as many ends as possible to be equal to one, except that VIJ is not going to allow for that. And uh, uh, in the middle of the way, I turned on my omega because if I did not turn on omega, I start with the zero ground state and that's still a ground state of the final problem, right? So I need to turn something that is off diagonal to allow for things to mix, 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 mix. And then I would get, uh, I would get the final state. So that was the process that we followed. Is this better, Niladri? Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm curious. So I missed the first part, but this is very interesting. So in I, this is the the population at uh, different different sites. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Right, and is this, uh, it's following some algebra or it's for me? No, 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 this, this is just a, the just number operator, right? Okay, I see. Right here, yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, of course, that this number for operator can okay. be shifted into a, into a sigma z 
And these guys here, this GIRG, they can be shifted into a Sigma X, right? So then it would be kind of like a... Uh, right, like, okay, okay, it's a two level but, system. Okay, right, yes, I, I get yeah. it. Yeah, but, but there is no hopping here, right? So far, so right. yeah, there's no hopping. Nice, nice. very interesting. So this is yeah okay Rabbi frequency and this is um uh okay and this is more like the Hamiltonian simulation from right okay I see now I was just thinking a bit far in the sense like if you are simulate can you do any kind of non-unitary evolution here at this so point? blockade okay. blockade I don't think blockade is ready with uh, uh, dissipative mm -hmm. uh, dynamics. Right. Uh, of any kind right now mm -hmm. of course blockade is open source so if you're interested in that uh, and once you contribute you're very welcome to okay, uh, that's cool. yeah because because we are already thinking on doing open quantum systems using unitary operations right so i'm just very curious how we can do those uh apply those kind of methods here right right Certainly very interesting yeah right but uh, but yeah, but of course, when you actually run uh, such a simulation on uh, on the actual quantum hardware, it is an open quantum system, right? So yeah, it will yes, definitely right. you definitely see the effects uh, from from the coherence, etc. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. No problem. There is a question uh, on the Google Doc as well, Pedro. Uh, Let's see. What is the the goal of the exercise? So a uh, nice question, what's the point of the exercise? Does it try to find something or just an exercise to demonstrate how to do a simulation? So uh, yeah, the, pro the purpose of this exercise here is really teach you how to use blockade from the beginning to the end to uh, you know, deploy the functions that you learned uh, yesterday, right? So the function to generate sites, to generate uh, your uh, uh, waveform protocol, and then do the simulation and do the data analysis, right? So there are some uh, some extra uh, functions here that you had not learned yesterday, and uh, that I'm not going to cover in details, but they're there for you to to play with. So you, you can access it on the GitHub page that I guess we we shared. Uh, and uh, um, the as an exercise, the the point of this is really to just show you how to do it. There is an extra exercise down here for you to uh, try to generate the other phases, right? So uh, there are like the start phase and you can you can try to play with a uh, blockade to do some small scale uh, uh, start phase. It's, pre it's pretty hard because the the kind of the unit cell of this this phase is kind of large, um, but uh, but you should be able to to generate some patterns here. And uh, um, so, so if you're able to to take what we just did for the square the the uh, the Z two checkerboard phase and reproduce for the start phase, you're probably pretty uh, good to go uh, with uh, to you know to to aim at doing your your own simulations uh, uh, of other quantum phases that can be on like other lattices or kind of uh, non-uniform systems. There are groups like uh, I guess Yannick, if I can if I can quote on you that are looking at uh, kind of uh, uh, the physics in kind of elongated systems. Uh, there are some uh, some uh, dynamics and phenomena related to high energy physics that are interesting that appear. So this is really to just give you the the, the basic tooling for for doing that. So if there are no questions, I really just uh, look at a summary. So the Hamiltonian, well, I guess we're just asked to flash it, but uh, here it is. I think it's good to, to remember it. If you keep forgetting it, tattoo it or something. <laughs> uh, but it's a, it's a very important Hamiltonian. Uh, and uh, uh, you can do a lot of uh, different kinds of simulations with it. So today I was just introducing some uh, adiabatic type of algorithm to you to prepare uh, uh, a quantum ground state. This same type of analysis can be used to, to 
uh, study the, the phase transition. So when you look at the criticality here and extract exponents, so you can extract correlation functions from this. And, uh, um, and uh, 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 yeah, so it, it's just to initiate you on blockade. All this pipeline can be exported from blockade to Aquila as well. So uh, there are instructions for that on the blockade page, but uh, Quera and I guess our friends at NERSC have uh, lots of experience also with this. So if you're interested in doing it, I bet you can talk to uh, uh, Katie then and uh, to us definitely as well. So that's it. I will just uh, uh, leave you with our learning objectives for a few more moments to see if you, you know, digest, if you are able to, to cover them indeed, and uh, ask questions in case you feel that there's something missing for you. And I guess we can open a, a formal Q&A session that goes beyond uh, beyond the, these lectures, but also maybe discuss problems that you may be interested in studying and uh, um, how can we help you think of, uh, of new ideas or, or understand your interests so that uh, uh, at Quera, we can also think of the next functionalities that uh, we will introduce. I just put my, my face here. And maybe we can, yeah, turn on the, the screens if we can. I'll just say from NERSC's perspective, we're evaluating these types of technologies for future users. So we, we do really want to hear about the problems you're interested in and what you might want to hear more about Quera um, or just neutral atoms in general. Go ahead. Uh, uh, and, and... Yeah, Nick, Go feel ahead. free. You're you're unmuted already. Go. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, is there uh, so uh, I'm not using uh, blockade, but I use the AWS uh, simulator, and uh, so it lets you do things that are not realistic. So you <laughs> let you put the atoms too close or ramping too fast. And then when you run it on the real machine, uh, it complains. So I think it would be nice to have something you can turn on and off was, you know, uh, before you run it on the, the, the device, it would, it, it's nice to test that it will. Yeah, so so I uh, we didn't cover this, but we can we can take a, a quick moment to to just browse uh, uh, this topic for a moment, and uh, so uh, let me see if I open this. Um, if you are using blockade instead of the the uh, AWS uh, uh, system. You can you can submit uh, jobs as well as I was saying, and uh, the way that that happens on blockade is through this function called hardware transform. So you had a Hamiltonian that you were just using on blockade that you're simulating. Suddenly you decide, oh, time to send it to Aquila. So what do you do? You call hardware transform, and uh, this hardware transform is gonna return to you a couple things. First is a transformed Hamiltonian that uh, instead of uh, being read by blockade is going to be read by AWS. And it will also give you transformation info. So this transformation info will tell you what has changed uh, from the perspective of like, let's say you on blockade, you defined a, a smooth sine wave for a waveform, but you know that it's going to be kind of pixelated in piecewise uh, linear functions, right? So it's going to tell you how it's transformed. It's going to even allow you to plot the difference. And uh, 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 in particular, oh, here it goes. Like, so, so this is some uh, type of thing that it's going to tell you how much it's changing for you. And uh, after you do the, the transformation, you can also uh, um, have a validation step. So you call validate, and uh, in validate, uh, it will uh, exactly complain, say, oh, you're putting atoms too close. Oh, this atom and that atom are not, not good. So it's going to stop you from submitting a job to AWS before you submit something that is going to just return an error uh, when it's your turn in the queue. 
So yeah, Blockade, Blockade is equipped for that. Uh, AWS not uh, as well equipped. Thank you. No problem. Antonio. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for the tutorial. It's been very interesting. Um, so I'm just wondering, given the um, hardware uh, in your system based on neutral atoms, you have this specific Hamiltonian that you operate with. So it, it's a bit, I, I can't quite see immediately if I want to map a, a different Hamiltonian. Uh, you know, uh, let's say I want to do a Hubbard model or something, I guess as long as you can write this thing in terms of Pauli matrices, something like this should be possible. Is there, is there a way of uh, doing so something usually, like this? Usually, usually um, it's, it's tricky. It's not every, like uh, learning how to do the mapping is not necessarily trivial. Um, hopping problems, again, this, this system is not a hopping, a hopping system, right? So, uh, sometimes you start with a 1D fermionic system, you do a Jordan Wigner, and you end up with uh, with a nice uh, like a spin model, right? And then uh, you can you can find uh, some connections and uh, and map one problem to another. But uh, uh, other times, um, it's uh, the the process requires a little bit of uh, uh, really creativity, right? To to see oh. If I create a domain wall of atoms and uh, you know of uh, excitations up and excitations down, and then I apply a pulse that makes that that uh, domain wall move, move, suddenly that thing behaves like a particle. So even though the system there is no hopping, the information transport can be can be seen as something that uh, that is moving. So. Uh, it really requires uh, thinking about the physics and thinking about the problem that you have in mind uh, to see uh, to see the kind of the applications that you have, right? So uh, we know that we can map uh, uh, string breaking, like for people that have an interest in QCD. Um, I, I guess Katie and uh, and Dan and 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 Mark and and Siva and Jan were mentioning yesterday that. Uh, we are working on some uh, bubble nucleation and other uh, type of problems that have uh, importance for both like high energy and and uh, and uh, uh, chemistry and plasma matter at the same time. So we're kind of covering covering the whole physics all at once. Uh, so uh, yeah, there is it, there is some need for some literature review and some thinking to 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 get to a problem. But uh, but uh, I do believe that uh, this uh, system is actually very flexible. You know that there, there are many, many problems that have not yet been explored with it. Thank you very much. Uh, another another point is uh, is dynamics, right? So uh, once you prepare a state and you kick it, what what does it do, right? Does it kick back? Does it complain? Does it? Uh, uh, what? Yeah. So there there are many things that you can you can think about. Yeah. More questions. Oh, one quick question. So I missed again the first part. Sorry, uh, but when you derive the Hamiltonian there that uh, for the system, uh, then you're using uh, light matter interaction kind of right. Then is it um, when you're doing the you're treating the the light quantum mechanically or semi classical? So uh, the the light matter interaction is not well i don't i, I don't want to say it's not important in the hamiltonian it, it is important for the controls part of the hamiltonian so like uh, the rabi frequency and uh, and the the detuning right so those things they come from light matter interaction uh, literally omega is like is it's, it's, it's the modulus square of the of the laser oh, right that is going on uh into the system uh the transitions they that go from ground to read is technically a two photon transition but I believe that most of this can be uh, can be just uh, seen from classical light. So you don't need to to worry too much. Now the interaction between the qubits that's something else that that doesn't require light at all. It's it's a right. dipole dipole uh, phenomenon that's going on. Right. So it's like interatom interaction really. So by show of hands, or by by let, let's not do by show of hands, by typing on the chat, right? How many 
how many of you uh, are in, uh, in like in high energy chemistry, physics? Uh, uh, so just just type your type your field on the chat so that we can do a little a little analysis. Okay, so we have uh, one, two, three uh, high energy physics, uh, one chemistry. I'm going to pull chemistry with molecular dynamics and condensed matter just because. So sorry about that, Katie. Uh, <laughs> so far for that. Oh, and laser plasma acceleration, condensed matter, uh, and a very much traditional computer software developer here. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, so there, there are many applications. I, I don't know, Yannick, do you want to make some comments on the, like how you're thinking about some high energy physics applications for this, just to help, uh, illustrate to others since we are all here. Oh. Uh, you're muted though. Yeah, so I'm uh, using uh, Quera for ladder structure where one of the dimension is like the spin of the excitation and the other is uh, for the space. And uh, so I'm thinking about going to higher dimension, but uh, so it has been uh, very nice to be able to, to use <coughs> facilities ourselves without depending on the, <laughs> the goodwill of the experimentalist. Uh, so it's, it's been, uh, and 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 the and the topic really the, that in the end of so like what what's in the interest in high energy physics so like yeah, so yeah. the the main goal is to do real time evolution in the non abelian gauge theories and so so we have uh, like a, a ladder to climb so we go from a model in a one plus one to two plus one and from abelian symmetry to non abelian symmetry so we have a road map. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very organized. <laughs> right. And uh, so I have a question for the NERX people. <laughs> uh, so I have a DOE contract and I use NERX, I mean, uh, uh, every year. So it, it's uh, fantastic to be able to have access to, you know, much higher uh, uh, capacity computing without mm -hmm. much uh, complication. And so are you planning to do something similar for Quera? Or? Potentially, potentially. We'll, we'll keep you updated. Um, but I think the next year uh, we'll be making some decisions about what kind of quantum hardware access we want. But it's something I think many of our users are interested in. So we're definitely thinking in that direction. Yeah. We'll also send out a survey after this training to ask for your input on, on what type of access to what type of systems would be useful for you. So because currently I have a small yeah. grant from AWS and I can use mm -hmm. it in research, but uh, having a nurse ask access would be fantastic for, for That's you. useful input for us. <laughs> yeah. It's also a useful input for us. <laughs> <laughs> So I would like to give a little nudge to, to the people that have been a little more quiet. Maybe uh, this is your chance to speak up. Uh, give us your feeling, give us your feedback. Uh, uh, give us like some feeling on, on what you would be interested in doing or what are your like main topics of interest. Um, so if you want to be a little more precise on on like what you paste on the chat, like the, the specifics. And, and and I'm curious also about uh, on the traditional computer software development, right? So so what kind of uh, computer software development uh, you're interested in doing, Daniel? And uh, because there there's lots of uh, uh, a lot that is needed uh, for us as well here, and uh, and uh, a lot of opportunity for um, like from from improving blockade to you know to improving things like the pipeline that uh, that Yannick was mentioning.
So any comments are welcome. I'm feeling we have a shy audience. <laughs> That's all right. We don't need to force anyone. <laughs> um, oh, we have a Neil. Mark Neil? Did you have? Oh, sorry. I'm sitting in a public cubicle, so <laughs> I just keep my cameras off. I crowd disperse. That's why. I... But yeah, to answer the question, uh, something similar to what uh, Jan is doing. So in particular, um, potential energy surfaces for uh, nitrogen molecule uh, interaction would be something interesting. So you're saying energy surfaces? Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, in this case, you're looking at uh, some type of VQE or phase estimation type of uh, thing, right? Sorry, let me begin by saying I'm very new uh, to quantum computing. Uh, I've just I done see. a couple of VQE uh, codes, but nothing to an extent where this well, is a full-fledged project. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's mostly electronic structure. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I hear, I hear. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, uh, doing, doing electronic structure with Aquila is pretty hard. Um, I think that there are some problems that... Uh, by miraculous chance and destiny or by a lot of cooking, uh, they can fit together. But there are other problems that in chemistry that do fit it, like uh, NMR, like some magnetic resonance, they fit much better. Our future generation of machines, they, they will definitely be able to, uh, to encode the kind of uh, fermionic problems as well uh, via standard, standard mappings and gate-based operation. Can you, can you say anything about the timeline for, for gates? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, when I say I can tell the roadmap, I cannot tell you how fast we are driving. Right? Okay. <laughs> I, 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 not, not in public. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sure. But, uh, but yeah, I, I think that, uh, um, we are actively working on our next generation of machines and our next generation. So, uh, when people talk about, uh, uh, you know, uh, what's your quantum computer? What did it do yesterday? What does the next one is going to do, right? Most people are like, oh, the previous one had 16 qubits and the next one has 32 qubits, right? Yeah. And uh, and that's not exactly how we are, <laughs> we are aiming at building our machines, right? So I guess I was mentioning uh, yesterday that the way we're looking at this is we build a machine that uh, is large and enough that uh, it solves interesting problems and now we include the programmability at scale so that we are not caught by surprise by a solution that worked before and doesn't work anymore when you, you double the system size right so mm -hmm. uh, uh so this means that uh, probably before you see the system increasing in size you'll be seeing more functionality like a gate base so that's probably the next thing that you will see is uh, uh, in our tech is going towards that direction. Any last questions? Yeah. Um, so there's always the question uh, education and versus research. Uh, so first, it's you know just to teach basic quantum mechanics. All these uh, Rabi oscillation are <laughs> the thing you have in the first chapter of the book, and so having a chance for the student to run something uh, uh, real, I think it could improve the intuition there for uh, right. quantum mechanics. Right. Then uh, you know for people who are progressing into research I was in a summer school teaching in a summer school in Germany last week and there were 70 students and a significant number installed the SDK <laughs> on their computer that's uh, more the AWS route but uh, so I, I think uh, for research and for education it's it's very important to have easy access to Right. I don't know what nurse can do about education or if 
partners can partner with, I don't know, NSF or <laughs> to give uh, easy access to. Uh, uh, yeah, getting more access to hardware and having more in-depth training sessions are definitely things we're considering. So for our traditional classical hardware, we have regular trainings for GPUs and other software. Uh, and as more people want access to quantum, I think that's going to become a larger part of what we do in our training cycles. We're slowly growing our quantum team. So this time two years ago, there were there was like half a person working on quantum at NERSC and now there's like five of us. So um, we, we plan to make education of the different software packages a regular part of training sessions going forward. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, on our side, we we are working a lot on educational materials. So uh, you will see that uh, we already have a GitHub there. We are working together with uh, Qbraid quite often to uh, help people access uh, those code books. Those those not the code book yet, but at least the GitHub materials in a fast, easy way. So whenever you do like an event, uh, um, uh, they can people can access easily. Uh, so it's not every event that we are doing like that. This one we are not, for example. But uh, uh, if you're interested, Yannick, in uh, in bringing the kind of blockade and this kind of things to to a future event, do reach out. We will talk to Kanav at Kilbraid, and we will we'll find a, we'll find a way. And uh, I, I am starting the development of a, a code book that will allow people to go through this material kind of independently of uh, uh, us uh, being in a classroom, but do it by themselves with quizzes, etc. So this will also come. It's uh, a lot of a lot of work, but uh, it will come together sooner or later. Yeah. So we have a former postdoc. Uh, we have a former Penny. postdoc yeah. who uh, just uh, went to Kubraid. So yeah. <laughs> uh, that, uh, yeah. I, I, we have contact. We keep in touch with them. Very well. So Dan, Katie, I think that we can more or less wrap up. Yeah, for if anyone comes up with questions later, you have access to the Google Doc. You can write them in there and we'll, we'll try to answer them. Uh, but thank you all for your time. Uh, we'll send you a survey. We want to hear what you think and what you want access to. Uh, but thank you for spending the last two mornings with us. Yes, and uh, I will- Thank you so much, Pedro. <laughs> oh, no, thank you. Thank you for receiving me. And uh, yeah. uh, I will- uh, Highlight and emphasize and uh, and 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 you know uh, I don't know repeat what Katie just said because uh, you know what all the, that you contribute in questions and in the surveys is going to probably directly affect uh, our your capacity you know to to have access to these resources in the uh, even like short term so uh, I think that it's very important for us to to hear from you so uh, yeah. Please, please contribute. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.